So under the Uniform Procedure Act, which are the following statements regarding the, employ the employment of an investment advisor representative by a state registered investment advisor is true? I believe one is true. One is definitely true. So you got uh, what, one in three chance. Um, yeah. <laughs> investment advisor is not required. Um, I believe two is not true. Absolutely. That's definitely not true. I mean, yeah. So I'm going to go. Patricia investment advisor. That's the one and three. I'm going to be absolutely one and three. Boom. Excellent. If a widow with no outside source of income and moderate financial resources asked you for investment advice, the most appropriate recommendation would be. Um, not one, not three. Um, I'm going to go with four only. Uh, is... You are correct. Good job. Uh, if an investor's portfolio uh, consists of a single stock, already screams uh, diversification. Yeah, if a stock has a correlation of uh, point, uh, plus nine, five, point nine five, what is added to the portfolio and the stock market turned bearish, what would be the likely effect of this additional security? That's kind of interesting. Well, I know negative correlation would be diverse, diversified, so that, right. that'll move in the opposite direction. So this will move. Um, I mean, it would move in the same direction, but I'm not sure that. Yeah, you're you're on the right track, exactly, right? So yeah. we, we, you are, I think for test purposes, you're absolutely right. We want negative correlation. Here, we've mm -hmm. got almost one perfect correlation. One would be perfect. So this means it moves almost the same identically to the security we already have. I always use in, uh, in my lectures, Home Depot and Lowe's, right? Or Exxon and Chevron, those pairs have the same correlation. Okay, it's in the same sector. Um, okay, so now if it's, since it's less than one, that's closer to negative, then it would be the perfect. So it would move, it would, I mean, I, that's why I'm confused because it's not, it's going to turn bearish, but none of these answers. Well, it's going yeah, to go. that's well, no, this is under modern portfolio theory. We're saying when you approach the same correlation, so I don't know where the negative is coming from. It's not negative. It's positive correlation plus yeah. 0.95, 95% to one, one being perfect correlation. So you haven't accomplished almost anything in that regard, right? Okay. What you're trying to do is get negative correlation. Now, don't ever tell me there's not enough information to tell. That's never correct, right? The yes. portfolio's value would remain the same. That definitely goes out. The portfolio's would decrease. So you should go up to a 50-50 year. Uh, the idea would be uh, point a negative 0.95. You were on the right track, by the way. The negative correlation yeah. is preferable situation. So you were on the right track. When it's, when it's one, it's not going to move, really. That's right. You know, it's not going to change. Right. The, 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 now, yeah, under modern portfolio theory, though, right? Your theory isn't truth. It's just a way of explaining things, so. Uh, the death benefit of a variable life policy. You don't get many variable life questions, but you know get, you might expect a couple. That is, I know it's, I believe it's annual link. Yeah, right on. Monthly. Trust yourself. Trust yourself, indeed. Right. So you know, when you, we get ready to squeeze the trigger on that test, you want to be squeezing the trigger. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. What were you going to add to that? No, I just said um, yeah. cash is monthly. Absolutely. Absolutely. If uh, general interest rates increase, the interest income on a bond unit investment trust will probably increase. Um, considering it's a fixed investment, um, you now I want to say between B and D. Um, yeah, I think you're right where you should be. So when I, when you get this, I call this RTFQ. So yeah. we're trying to choose between C or D. So we might want to reread that, read this again. If general rate interest rates increase, the interest income, the interest income on the UIT will probably. So it's a fixed portfolio bonds. So it pays a fixed. So we asked you about rate. the prices. The prices would go down. It's not asking about the prices. It's about asking about the income you're receiving. I'm going to say D, remain the same. Right 
That would be easy to miss a question like that. Yeah, I yeah. very easily could have, I could have missed this one too. If you're going quick, I do this all the time on these kind of questions. Like, ah, an easy one. And I go, oh, damn, how I miss that? <laughs> An investor sells 10 5% bonds at a profit and buys another 10 bonds with a five and four, a quarter coupon rate. The investor's yearly return will increase by. No, oh, no. Doing a little math. That makes it, math makes it easier. Yeah. Um, Wait. And then it'd be ten thousand two five. It'll be uh two fifty. Excellent. Take your time on those math questions because you know this is like yeah. actually more likely the math you're gonna get than some of that stuff that people worry about, right? So you want to, when you get the math, the three, four math questions, and if you can do it, you want to do it. If an investment advisor is engaged a website designer. What may the designer include in uh, on the website? Mm -hmm. I believe I want to say a. I'm not. I'm not telling my answer yet. Um, okay. They can't recommend stocks just on a website. That's that. exactly right. Funding investments. Yeah, I'm compensated right. third-party endorsements. I'm going with a. That's a great great answer. You're correct. Which of the following is most commonly used when the author wants to express end of life wishes? What do you want us to do when you check out? Um, I remember testamentary trust. I don't think I ever saw it in the book, but I remember there being an answer about it. I want to say it's this one, and that's obviously not a good way to go about yeah. questions. But um, and that's the thing. I don't. What is, what is testamentary? What is that? Testamentary mm -hmm. trust is a trust that's created after you die. But this created is not after. about the trust. It's just about what do you want me to do? Okay, yeah, that's a term I didn't understand. Um, I'm going to go... I'm going to go... Well, I'd say it's a will. Yeah, you. I, I think you, that's what you want to do here, the Sesame Street trick. Your yeah. will is what you tell me you want done. Trusts yeah. are how we manage your money, right? Either while you're alive or while you're dead. And so the answer here is indeed a living will. Sometimes we'll express this as a medical directive. You know, what do you want us to do, right? You know, us to mm -hmm. donate your organs or whatever. Yeah. One of the ways a simple trust differs from a complex trust is it simple trusts. I think it's C. I don't know that simple you're, and complex you're means. You're absolutely correct. So, you know, got to trust your gut. Your gut's been pretty good so far. So as we said, you want to trust your gut. So unlike complex trusts, simple trust must distribute. Complex trust, they can distribute, keep it. They can do whatever they want. So uh, good job. It's not like simple trust is easier. It's obviously not. That's not that simple. Yeah. yeah, it's, simple. A, yeah it's not. The corpus is Latin for the body and the body of the, the bond. You don't do that in simple trust. Good job. Get a couple of trust questions. An investment advisor yeah. with no place of business in state is exempt from registration with the state when making recommendations to all of the following except. Um, registration with the state. Um. Or it's an accept. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the what the list of. Yeah, what I would always want want you to, as your tutor to think about is this idea of protecting retail investors. Right, so I have no place of business in the state, an investment advisor, and I have no retail customers. So I would be using what I call the Sesame Street trick here. 
so then that would mean it would be a because if you're no state of that's right. business that's right there's no such thing as accredited investors as it applies to the uniform securities act if i'm a doctor and i have a 10 million dollar net worth i'm a retail investor on the uniform securities act all that 10 million means is that if i want to i can participate and accept a reg d invitation so be careful on it, it says individual residents of the state doesn't matter their credit or not their residents of the state i got to register right and then it doesn't matter what comes next i mean one retail you know uh, you know unless it's de minimis uh, it's, i'm going to have to register uh with regard to the nasa statement of policy on dishonest and unethical business practices of broker dealers and agents proscribed actions would include which of the following proscribed just means prohibited and you know, that's one of the challenges on the on this test they use you know fancy legal words for stuff which is sometimes means you just almost got to read it once to kind of figure out you know what you're being asked yeah. okay prohibited um well two two would be fine that's, that's exactly right. right that's what you should do absolutely i love that yeah. by the way that's pretty helpful because uh you said two would be fine, so we can get rid of two. We can get rid of A, B, and C with that. Ding, 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 ding. Um, so, now, uh, I should tell you as a tutor, Sam, I do believe in uh, telling people how or helping people become be better test takers. And I do get heat for the guy who's in charge of this, by the way, is a guy named Chuck Lowenstein. And uh, Chuck and my friend Brian Lee, people who write tests, they get upset because they fall prey to the tricks they think are, are not worthwhile which are yeah. process of elimination, Sesame Street trick, uh, too long to be wrong right now. I want to yeah. preface that by saying, I want you to learn the information. Yeah. But when all else fails, you know, then, yeah. then we whip out a trick. Right? So, yeah. By the way, just to be clear, it is uh, three and four, right? So we didn't know. It. By the way, another, you know, I, I can just hear Chuck and Brian right now with burning ears. Um, <laughs> the other thing that's great here is we also now, as a test taker, got free information. By eliminating two, we now can read three and four and say, well, maybe I know three and four, maybe I don't, but let me see if I know this. And if not, maybe I'll be able to use it down the road somewhere, right? So I read three, mm -hmm. offering a repreach of security on a original case if it does not increase in value. I, I knew that. But if I didn't, I'd say, thank you very much. Borrowing money, yeah. I knew that. So I didn't get any free information, but perhaps I might have. Perhaps I might have. On the Uniform Securities Act, a guaranteed security is protected by someone other than the issuer against a loss, all of these except. Guaranteed security is protected. Well, it's protected. Um, Principal is protected. That's right. On debt securities and interest on debt securities is protected in that way. Um, I'm kind of talking. Yeah, because I'm, well, you know, I want to say I would go with the, what I would do here is I'd probably kind of try and make up my own example, like a uh, holding company, a parent company that has a subsidiary. And can the parent company guarantee the dividends on the common or preferred stock? More likely preferred, but yes. Can they guarantee the interest on the bonds of the subsidiary? Yes. Can they guarantee the principal repayment on those uh, bonds? The answer is yes. Do they guarantee principal and equity securities? There's there's really not kind of a thing called principal and equity securities, right? So kind of a funky one, kind of a funky one. I wouldn't go for D or what are you going for? Yeah, D's right. D's definitely right. Yeah, I think um, I would go for D. I look, it's kind of a funky answer set, but given that answer set, that's what I think they're looking for. Uh, which of the following statements concerning international direct investing? Oh my, you're a brave soul. I, I think what that means is we're not going to use a mutual fund and we're not going to use an ADR. That's directly in there. Into the that's what I think direct means. Uh, yeah. yeah, I may be wrong, but that's what how I would have read that. I think you're right. Um, well, I know A is true. I know well, it's usually not as readily available. Yeah, so you have a choice um, to make, by the way, as a test taker. You said you know A is true. So now when you're practicing like we are, maybe you don't want to just guess A and move on. You want to see what your other choices are. But I exactly. would, Sam, I'm gonna recommend perhaps on the test because we got to be conscious of not running out of brain power like at question 90. So whether we want to take like mm -hmm. a strategic pause every 30 questions or so, uh, but if a question like this, I nail it, like we got that other one pretty quick too, right? We, boom, we got rid of room or two, we, boom, boom. 
there is something to be said for aiming, shoot, point and click and matriculating down the field as quick as possible. You know, be, be quick, but don't hurry, right? So that you're, when you're question 90, you still have some brain power left because sometimes people when they're struggling, it's just, I, I'm I'm guilty too. When I get tired, my reading skills diminish. And then when my reading yeah. skills start to diminish, then, you know, I can get in some trouble. All right, let's look at what's not correct. Foreign markets are usually mature and offer no growth opportunities. No, I mean, that's all about going to foreign markets, right? Rates of return on foreign yeah. securities are generally less. Now, why would I hazard my capital if it was less? No. In addition to foreign <laughs> currency, uh, foreign securities a, to a portfolio, you can increase portfolio risk to different markets of foreign market. The addition of foreign may result in increased... Per, no, no, that would be the opposite because it would have negative correlation. The reason you would go into the international markets is to try and get some different correlation to your U.S. investments. Mm. So A is correct. An advisor that seeks to outperform the market is said to be engaged in... Um, if you want to outperform, you, you're you being active. Right, I'm very testable. They're prejudicial on the test, by the way. On the test, no surprise, because NASA is attorneys. They prefer passive management to active management. Passive and you've got to be able to contrast why, right? Passive management typically has a lower cost structure. It's more tax efficient, right? So on the test, they're going to be uh, you know, uh, prejudicial. Uh, the advisor buys a substantial block of stock for customers. The order was filled in several prices. Which of the following would dictate how I'm going to allocate that to my clients? Um, I know you can't kind of um, be biased on it. That's right. Um, so I love it. So bias, the fancy word, you're absolutely right, Sam. It's called discriminatory, right? You can't. Oh, okay, there's my favorite guy, man. Sam was nice to me today. I'm giving him the juicy execution. Now we're, oh, man, there's that jerk. Right? So you're right. You can't, have, you can't be biased. Um, According to a fair method, uh, I believe it's C. Yeah, it's anytime not, they I'm ask you, you should be fair and reasonable. You know, I'm, I'm into it with this guy, Sam, today, and I'm, I'm tempted in my exchanges with him to say, do you think that's fair and reasonable? Because I think what I'm offering you is fair and reasonable. We should never be unfair and unreasonable. Well, you know, uh, XYZ is registering a new issue of common stock. A final prospectus must be delivered within the statutory time limits, too. Um, that's a, you get a prospectus when you purchase, uh, right on. So, but that's not the question. Yeah, hey, there you not, go. Uh, yeah, so would, yeah, that's what they're adding. Per, per, anybody who buys it gets the prospectus, right. Uh, a money market fund would be least likely to invest in which of the following? I kind of like this one. Yeah, um, I know that's a short term. Money market's a short term. That's right. Less short -term. High quality debt maturing in less than a year. High quality debt maturing in less than a year. I know jumbo CDs and repos are all part of short term as well. Absolutely. So You're absolutely correct. Um, yeah, because A's are me medium term. Yeah, so you got to decide now what of the two left, what do you want? Do you want newly issued T notes or newly issued treasury treasury bills? T notes, because it's uh, immediate. Two to 10 years, right on. You nailed it. You know, and then remember that would be for somebody who has a short time horizon. They love, they give you a question like somebody who's buying a home six months from today and you should put their money in a money market fund or money market security. Uh, which of the following are prohibited practices? Prohibited practices. I know two is prohibited because you have to notify clients of a departure. Even I like it. Small. So you're correct. So we need two. So that's helpful. We got a 50 50 now. Two. Uh, so we got two and three, one, two, one and two. Um, so, two, an investment organized as a partnership did not notify its clients of the departure of a partner. There you go. That requires notification. You are correct, too. Okay. So, um, No, I, I don't want. I think it's. I think it's three, and I don't think it's a. Or sorry, I don't think it's one because they notified the client. Yeah, but, but be, be careful on the timeline there. Well, be careful on that number one timeline. Invest. I transferred your stock, transferred your account, and then after I did so, 
I told you. Tell beforehand. Listen, I'm going to be ballistic, Sam. If you, you know, say, Dean, I transferred your account because you went below the minimum. Now I'm forming. I said, well, Sam, you didn't have my permission to do that. You need to talk to me first, right? So the timeline so is one. Important. Yeah, it's one and two. Yeah, right. The key point that makes number one not correct is it's the the, the sequence. It said, I told you I did that. No, I'm going to do that. I got to tell you, I said, Sam, unfortunately, you've fallen below our minimum. So you know, And that stands true for most questions, right? Yeah. It's, you want to tell the client before you do something? That's exactly right. Uh, regional financial services is a registered investment advisor state A, B, C, and D. So we know from that they're not federally covered. They've just filed yeah. a registration in state E. Uh, registration of this investment advisor in state E automatically confers registration as an investment advisor rep uh, in state E on. Um, I know it's not B. Clerical employees are right. registered in that way. Um, well, it's not A because you're talking about state E. That's right. Um, I think it's D. You are correct. And that is very much a desk question, right? They already have the information they need on me. This, by the way, this doesn't mean I'm not going to have to take a 65 or anything. It just means that information is available to the state administrator and state E. Uh, an investment advisor plans to sell securities out of its own investment account to an advisory client. In order to do so, which of the following is required? It's definitely consent. So definitely two. Always, yeah. So you got a 50, 50, two. We always need client consent before the completion of the trade. Completion of trade is settlement. That is correct. Um, I think it's three. Yeah, I wish you'd be a little three. more, you know, fake it till you make it. You're right on those things. So, you know, if you're going to go down, go down even with that confident voice, right? Like, well, it's two and three. Not, I think it's two and three. Two and three. And then if you're wrong, you say, oh, you <laughs> know, you know, whatever, right? Uh, whatever. I was teaching a class. I had a guy who kept putting in the chat question marks. And, you know, I said, Sam, I understand that you you are using question marks. But moving on, I want you to use exclamation points. I will know that your exclamation point is really a question. But, you know, let's try and get to that uh, that kind of a confidence level. By the way, there's no reason for you so far not to trust your gut, Sam, because, you know, everything you've been kind of like just talking to yourself. But you want to do that. You want to talk to yourself. I get in trouble with this because I'd be talking to myself. I go, oh, look at this, man. In fact, they can get me here. And then they come and say, Mr. Tinney, other people trying to take the test. I'd say, well, I don't care about the other people. Look at this one, trying to trick me here. You know, I'm joking. But, you know, you want to be as proactive as you can as you're taking these questions. A form of business structure that ex uh, exposes all personal assets of the owner to creditors is. Ooh. Okay. Well, here's my thinking is that since there's creditors, I wanted to say sole proprietorship because it exposes all your personal assets. Yeah, because you and the business are one and the same. You are correct. So it is that, even though there's creditors? What's that? Even though there's creditors to it? Uh, yeah, if you have creditors, you're a sole proprietor. They're coming after your personal assets. In a sole proprietorship, there are, there are partners. Well, limited partnership, no. General partnership, yes. If you're a general what about a sole partner? Are, are you there? You're, okay, you froze a little bit. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. I was talking the sole proprietorship I'm asking. I, I didn't think there were, were creditors. Oh, well, well, no, there could be. If I if I want to, like Dean's mowing service, it's a sole proprietorship, and I want to go borrow money for a trailer to put my lawnmower and my uh, my shovels and my rakes and all that stuff, right? I go down to okay. Home Depot, and they offer me a Home Depot uh, credit card or something, and I uh, charge up a storm and, uh, you know, my, my lawn mowing business doesn't work out so well. I always joke, that's not really the bigger problem. The bigger problem is if I'm mowing a lawn and some rock, you know, gets kicked up and hits some kid in the head. There's always some personal injury attorney saying, has your kid been hit by a rock? Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're coming after me for everything. Now, on the actual test, there is a question about a husband and wife who have a general partnership, a family business that's a general partnership. And then they ask you on the test, why would they consider dissolving the general partnership and forming an LLC? And then you would answer because of the liability. So okay. that would be one reason to have the LLC because in a limited liability, keyword, limited liability corporation, that would not be true, Sam. Okay. 
Under the Securities Act of 1934, which of the following would not be grounds for disqualification of a broker-dealer's registration? I know that violating the Securities Act is grounds. I know that. Right on. Um, court order from practice, stop me from practicing is um, conviction misappropriation also would be. I'm going to go A. Yeah, right on. You know, everybody gets sued. I mean, you know, it's... Yeah, whatever. the first time you probably you feel bad. You know, the, you know the, 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 yeah, sue me, whatever. You know, uh, an agent has a client who's relatively new to investing in securities. So I'm thinking, got to be gentle with this person. Having been a bank CD purchaser most of her life, oh my goodness, uh, I don't even know if I want to do business with her. One of the clients <laughs> holdings of stock the agent recommended, and its market price has fallen over ten percent. Knowing her fear of loss, the agent comforts her. Oh man, by continuing to report the stock is moving upwards. Oh my God. Now you got to remember this was written in the 1950s when people didn't have their own quote machine. So, you know, you would only know what the stock is trading at through me. So, you know, this is kind of a classic. Um, well, it'd be C because it's fraudulent and you're giving them fictitious. Yeah, right. yeah, you got to give no, that's a big time test water. We don't make give people feel good. I call them feel good quotes. You know, we yeah. give them with a real quote. Uh, individual and assets of 500 and has debts of 300. What's the net worth? Oh, uh, it's easy math. Three, uh, I was gonna say, Sam, it don't get much easier than that. Angels weep for you. Got a yeah. If you can't do that one now, by the way, I would also say that this is testable on two levels, the individual level and the corporate level, right? But what I mean by that is we have to know the classical balance sheet equation, which is assets minus liabilities equals net worth. Uh, all the following are requirements to be a salesman of variable products, except. Well, you're selling a security product. Um, Start there. Well, that would mean you'd need to be affiliated with a broker dealer since you're selling a security. Um, also, uh, Affiliation with a uh, registered investment advisor. So right, on. right on. General security. So would it be a life insurance? Uh, life well, insurance? no, you got to have the life insurance because a variable is a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. There are people who are investment advisors that don't make commissions selling either securities or life insurance. Right. So you're going to have to have a valid insurance license. You missed that one. Right. Okay. So exactly. it's been. Yeah. We're trying to get a good score. So I'm going to mark you wrong on that one. Don't miss that again. Though. Let's, let's be clear. I don't. I don't really care about the registered investment advisor, but you should know that to sell variable products, I have to be registered. You are on the right track. I have to be registered to sell the securities part of the product. So that means I need to take a six or a seven and work at a broker dealer, and then I have to be able to sell insurance. And that means I have to have an insurance license, right? So those are the two I need. So uh, I don't. There are investment advisors that don't sell things. Okay. Uh, which of the following is not included in the fundamental analysis uh, of a company? I know I I relate fundamental analysis to financial statements. Um, right so um, I'm going to B because that's the yeah, B is technical, technical analysis. B is technical analysis. You are correct. Uh, which of the following uh, situations would require registration as an investment advisor? Um, one would require that. Yep, you're uh, correct. Not very. Well, by the way, we, you know, you got one. Now this is the reverse. We <laughs> could have shot the answer set and said, "Okay, well, I got to take one." <laughs> you know, so you're correct. One. Um. Well, two also would be because you're earning commission. You're recommending it and earning commission. Well, it says, "Which of the one would require registration?" As be careful. Investment mm. advisor, not agent of broker dealer. Mm. So if I'm an agent at uh, Fisher Investments, for example, investment advisor rep at Fisher Investments, I'm going to call the broker dealer and tell the broker to buy or sell a security. I, the 65, the investment advisor rep at Fisher Investments and Fisher Investments does not receive a commission. Right, because it says in which of the functions would require registration as investment advisor. Investment okay. advisors 
don't earn commissions. That would require you to be a broker dealer. Right? So it's not two. One, a broker dealer provides resurfaces and charges a fee. You're right there. Two is not. Remember the definition? A, B, C. Do I give yeah. investment advice? Do I tell yeah. you I'm in the business of giving investment advice? And do I want compensation? All right, let's look at I got compensation. Yeah, so three. A broker dealer has okay. its agents prepare financial plans for a nominal fee. That doesn't matter. Fee. The plan okay. recommends securities transactions. The year earns the commissions on those. The part that makes three uh, a definition of an investment advisor, the financial plan for a fee. Right, so that's the three answer. Let's look at four. Uh, a broker dealer charges its customers for collecting dividends and maintaining their accounts. In addition to commission charges, there's no fees there. Okay. And it's not a fee for investment advice. So it's one and three. That one was pretty tough. Yeah. That was pretty tough. But remember, get the key words. You, I almost say, you know, I always think when I go to like a play and they have a playbill, and in the playbill, they have a, at the front, they tell you the cast of characters. And then, you know, mm -hmm. about maybe the second act, I don't have to refer to the the playbill. But boy, every question you read, you got to say, is this about a broker dealer? Is this about an investment advisor? Is this about an agent? That's the cast of characters. Is this about the administrator? Is it about the issuer? So that one's a tough one. That one's a tough one. Yeah. Commission's not a, commission's not a fee. That's, That's right. Just Right. The way I think it is, is brokers make transactions, transactions, and, uh, you know, investment advisors make fees. A technical analyst with a lo uh, long position, with a long position, would enter a sell stop below. I kind of like this one. Below. Um, well, you don't want it to drop below its right support on. level. Right on. There you go. The B. Uh, and comparing the change in the D GDP from one year to another, to arrive at an accurate figure, each year's GDP should be converted into which of the following? I kind of like this one. Well, it wouldn't be international dollars. I don't know why that would make any sense. <laughs> you know, I, I love that. So good way to way to attack, right? What the hell is that? <laughs> you know, if you if you don't know what it is, don't take it as an answer because they're really good at making up stuff. I can't tell you how many times on debrief you say, I'm going to call me somebody like you and say, hey, Dean, what, what are international dollars? I said, I have no idea. There's Euro dollars, but why'd you answer that? Oh, because I've you know, never seen it before. I go, well, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, I think it's constant dollars. Yeah, constant dollars is testable. Those are dollars measured for inflation. And so that's the, that's the takeaway, right? So constant dollars are measured for inflation. So, you know, they might say, you know, GDP went up eight, uh, inflation was eight. What was GDP in constant dollars? You'd say zero. Uh, if a broker dealer provides investment advice or discretionary portfolio management services to its clients and the firm also recommends or sells uh, products that it or its affiliate recommends or issues. You would have to disclose that. Uh, that would be a Sunlight is the best disinfectant. So, so we got two choices that say disclose. You're correct. So now you got to pick up pick A or B for for this. It's uh, it's B. The conflict of interest trying to sell the products. Right on. Uh, an investor buys five percent uh, trip double A corporate bonds at par. After a year, his total return is four percent. The most likely explanation for this, I kind of like this. Total return is what you make from the income plus or minus. In this case, minus because it's four. Uh, your, uh, you know, price up or price down. Well, that would mean interest rates decreased. Uh, interest rates increased, right? Increased because your bonds went down, right? If you bought a bond that was paying you $50, right, at par, and then I'm your broker and I call you and I say, hey, Sam, you go, to, hey, Dean, what was my total return here on that bond? I said, well, our total return on the bond was only uh, 4%, $40. And he said, well, geez, how did that happen? I said, well, interest rates went up and that caused your bond to go what? Down. So you lost some money on the bond. You're still getting $50 in annual interest. 
Mm -hmm. We have to adjust that for the loss we're sitting on and the bond. Yeah. So that's okay. why you I... actually made uh, you made four. So I'm going to mark you wrong just because we want to get a good score. Yes. So uh, interest rate rates increase, causing the bond to decrease, and you are on the backside. Of that. By the way, as a test taker, though, you're still on the right track. Again, I uh, some people don't believe in what Dean's about to share with you. I do believe in practicing our test taking skills while doing practice questions. Mm -hmm. And the reason you're right on the track is because B and C are opposite answers. Mm -hmm. And almost always when you have opposite answers, it's one of them, right? It's one of them. The reason that trick works is you can't leave opposite things in the same answer set. You know, the one I always use to illustrate this concept is Socrates is a dog, Socrates is a philosopher. I mean, he can't be both a dog and a philosopher. It's got to be one or the other. A banner on a broker dealer's website is considered. Well, uh, I would have to assume that a banner doesn't change, meaning it would be static. Perfect. Perfect. Right? So, so sometimes, sometimes common sense does work. You know, what the words mean. Uh, mutual funds are particularly true of that because the mutual fund's name almost gives it away about what kind of fund it is. So excellent. It is not uncommon for many federal covered advisors to be affiliated with a broker dealer. I'd say, oh, that's me. Uh, take the case where an investment advisor rep like Sam with a federally covered advisor is also an agent of the broker dealer like Sam. When dealing with advisory clients, all the following are true except. So if you can put yourself into the answer set, sometimes it's helpful, my broker dealer, my state, you know, whatever it happens to be. Okay. All the following are true. It's not true. Um, the IAR is not liable for losses suffered in the account. That's right. So remember, it's an accept. You're on the right track. Um, I think the advisory services are separate from the broker dealer. That's right. Um, that is. That's yes. true. You're looking for something that's false. Yeah. Um, well, since you're a broker, you're affiliated with a broker dealer, you will earn commission in addition to the fees. True. That's true. All right. So B. B. The IAR must disclose trades. No, you do have to disclose that. You do have to disclose that. Yeah. The answer is D. D. Right? Yeah. Huh. You, do you have to say, this is Sam, do you, the Sam, say to the client that you as a rep are liable for losses in their portfolio due to poor portfolio performance? You do not say that. That is false. D is. I thought I, I, thought I said that earlier. Oh, you did said you? It was true. Oh, I hit the, yeah, I hit I the wrong one. My bad. My bad. Oh, you're fine. I'm the button That's pusher. Push the wrong button. <laughs> Pay attention. Took yeah, I thought that sounded time. a little off. Yeah. A broker dealer registered in all 50 states using both radio and television advertisements to promote its services directs prospects to a toll-free number that will connect them with a registered agent. An existing customer living in New York calls and is connected to an agent in Cleveland who is registered in Ohio, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. The client asks the agent to recommend something that would fit the existing accounts uh, stated investment objective under the Uniform Securities Act. Hmm. Okay. Um, I think it's C because it's an unsolicited call. Yeah, you got to be registered to take that call. So it's about the agent. It's not about the security. So you're you're focused on the security and they're asking about the agent. So this isn't about whether the, the transaction's exempt. It's about the agent. Mm -hmm. And so what you should do is transfer that call to somebody who's registered in New York. Mm -hmm. I say, sorry, uh, Sam, unfortunately, I'm not registered in New York. You're still doing great, though. No red flags yeah. whatsoever. 
Under the Investment Advisor Act of 1940, by the way, I don't know, I've, I've been trying to get Kaplan to put like a percentage of people who get it right and wrong. So, you know, mm -hmm. you would look at this and I can tell you this is one that people miss all the time. I don't think it makes you feel better. But, you know, whether it's Kaplan or STC or my friend Brian has a question like this and that's what people miss. It's about the agent, not not the security. Under the Investment Advisor Act of 1940, persons who provide a variety of services, including investment advisory services, are considered to have received compensation for their advice when they receive which of these? Receive compensation when they, certainly when they receive an economic benefit, um, a fee, certainly, um, commission on the sale of real estate, just give free advice. Um, I think it's one and two. I don't see why. Three. So let's see. Three says a commission on the sale of real estate. When the agent advertises, she will give free advice regarding the proceeds of the sale of any home she uh, lists. So it looks like you're tying your investment advice to compensation. Right? In other words, three says that I'm giving you free advice. Am I really giving you free advice if you're paying me for selling the house? Yeah. Not really, right? Yeah. It's one, two, and three. Not a bad miss. You were correct as one, two. The thing that makes it uh, compensation is because she's tied it to that, right? You yeah. know, who's the investment advisor here? And is there compensation? And she's certainly getting compensation. Not another tough one. Uh, the return on treasury bills is 3%, and the equity risk premium is 4%. Uh, the expected return should be. Mm -hmm. I think this will be a math problem. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. The risk-free rate. Um, I don't remember, is the risk-free rate minus the market return? Well, you. you this is actually you. You would be correct, but it's asking you to go the other way. So they didn't give us the stock return. They gave us the treasury bill, and then they told us we would expect to get in the market 4%. And so that would be seven, right? And then we would minus seven from three would be four, would be that that four. So most of the time you would be minusing that. So okay. the expected return is the risk-free rate of return plus the risk premium. So this is 7%. But most of the time you would have been right. So if I would have said the market return was, and then I gave you the risk free, then you'd be minusing that. Maybe we'll maybe we'll bump into one of those. Right. Am I expect, are you expect to see a couple of those? Math yeah, like I, I I told you we might bump into. It. Look, we're at question thirty six. I'm it's trying to get more fast. aggressive. Sam, I wish I were more aggressive on this. Um, I I worry about people who, on the analytical method stuff, like you know present value, future value, capital asset pricing model. They go down a rabbit hole and it's okay if they still have time for the other things, but that isn't the broad avenues and highways of the 66. And, you know, it's more likely you're gonna have to total return or working capital or, you know, current yield, then you're gonna have to do that kind of math. And what I would suggest, and to those people, it may not be you, because your performance right now, and this is what I always want us to be at, is abundance. And we're operating from abundance like you are. You know, I've been marking wrong when you get wrong. Uh, that means any one thing isn't going to kill you. Whereas if you're on the edge, every scarcity, every question might be passing or failing, not where you want to be. I'm saying if you're operating from abundance, you're in that mid-70, high-70 range, and you do get one, we might bump into one. And I'd like us to be in a position to either know how to do it or just say, you know what? I'm going to guess B and I'm going to sign that to the universe. I'm going to make it up elsewhere. Right? Okay. So... We'll see if we, um, I had a guy very similar. He said, Dean, uh, who's you know, 66. He said, Dean, I'm not paying you $225 an hour to do math with me. He said, I'm a serious <laughs> math geek. You give me any two numbers. I can solve for the third. So let's just skip that. And I make him sound like he had more hubris than he did, but he passed. But then when he called me, he said, Dean, I did myself a disservice because, you know, they didn't ask me to do the math. They asked me to recognize the formula and that I hadn't done. I mean, I could figure it out because I had to make up some numbers. I, as I said, I'm a math geek. I could do it. But I wish I would have just paid a little more attention to like working capitals, current assets, minus current liabilities, the recognition input part of it. You know, and I, I totally think that's that's it. I just uh, did some debrief 
Uh, I'm not allowed to ask you like what was question 35, but I am allowed to ask you what should we worked on more or less and consistently three, four math questions max. Uh, sometimes people don't even see some of that higher end stuff. And when they do, it's not make or break. So that's my my thoughts. Okay. I still go in and do it. My friend Brian gets mad. I mean, we're doing live streams and people ask questions and I'll answer them even though, you know, and I can, he gives me this look like, why are you even going down there with them? And then it's not, it's not something I should be spending time on. I'm like, okay, well, you know, my bad. <laughs> Which of my statements regarding a state registered advisor with custody of customer assets is true. I know that you have to send a statement every three months. Right on. Good job. Boom. Uh, which of all bond diversification strategies involves purchasing only short-term and long-term uh, bonds? I know the barbell. I believe it's barbell because yeah, the, that's a barbell. Right? The barbell is nothing in between. That's why it's called the barbell. Uh, the one they like to ask a lot is which one of these is the most conservative in terms of interest rate risk? Is that laddering? Right on. And then the other one they like to ask is, uh, you know, I have a customer whose kid is starting college in 18 years, uh, just had the kid baby shower. So I buy 18-year bonds. Uh, next year, when she's one, I buy her 17-year bonds for maturity. Next year, I buy her 16-year bonds, 14, 13, 12. What would that be called? I'm having all the bonds are going to mature when she's 18. That's bullet, right? Right. And then they would ask you, why would you do that? Because you need to set some money at some future date, right? Oh, my bad. Forgot to hit the button. Yeah, right. Uh, Barbell. Uh, which of all characteristics best exemplifies a value stock? So they don't like to give you questions like this, either value or growth stock. Um, I know growth stocks maintain, they don't pay out a dividend, so they're going to keep a lot of money. Right on. Um, so... You know, obviously, value would be the opposite of that. It's exactly um, so they're out. So that one for sure. I want to say price the book. They would have a low price, high PE. Um. Because I know typically growth stocks have a higher price, right? That's right. That's right. I want to say D. You're correct. Trust yourself, my friend. Trust yourself. Everything you want to say is usually the right answer. Uh, high earnings, I think NVIDIA. A is NVIDIA. That's a chip company. It's just killing it right now. They got high earnings per share, high profitability. Low price to book, okay. High PE, no. Value, if you're a value investor... You're looking for a low PE. You want less years to take in earnings to get back your price. So that second part makes B false. C, low earnings per share, high profitability. Nah, that doesn't make any kind of sense. And then you're right. Here I got price, low price to book. You know, in fundamental analysis, this is, you know, my margin of safety. The margin of safety is I didn't overpay. I paid a low price relative to book value. The, the assets are worth the residual claim. And I paid a low price to earnings. It doesn't take me much in years to get back my earnings. The main difference between current ratio and quick ratio is that quick ratio excludes inventory. Right on. Good job. I do think that's one of the major differences between the seven and the 66. There is more balance sheet stuff for sure mm -hmm. on 66. Which of the following are restrictions on the operations of a registered open-end investment company under the Investment Company Act of 1940? I remember you saying that you can open a register or an open-end company with a hundred thousand. Yeah. So right, it's hard to believe. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, yeah, that's, that's that's out. <laughs> one. Oh, there we go. <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> I just can't believe, you know, like I say, I'm just astounded they've never adjusted that. So 100 grand, 100 shareholders, and we're, we got a mutual. Yeah, it seems so low. I'm with you. 
I do te tease people when I'm teaching class. I, if I've got a big class, I say, listen, we could probably start a mutual fund with just the amount of resources we have in this class. You know, <laughs> A prospective client has been interviewing a number of investment advisors and wishes to see your firm's investment policy statement. Your investment policy statement would probably include which of the following? Um, they all seem pretty reasonable. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. All four. Oh. Uh, the formula for computing uh, combined equity in a mixed margin account is. Ooh, good one. Um, that's a. Uh, it's credit minus. Um, is it the long market value? Yeah, I think the best analogy uh, is a house, right? Market value of the house minus mortgage on the house equals equity in the house. Long market value minus debit equals equity. And then on the short account, it's going to be the credit register, the cash minus what I owe in securities equals equity. So combined. Um, I think it's A. Yeah, right on, right? Credit balance in the short account. Uh, and this minus this current market value of the long plus the current market value of the shorts minus the debit balance. Uh, the thing I'm struggling with here, the, it's not going to be the credit balance minus the current market value of the long. It's going to be the credit balance minus the short market value. So let's see. Short, uh, current market value. Now, uh, current market value of long positions plus the cash. So there, there are our assets. Let me just get out my, this is a pretty tough one. I'm not sure I'd worry about it, but so here, that's my assets and my long account. There's my asset and my short account. Uh, minus the short market value, there's what I owe in my short account. And there's what I owe in my margin account. So kind of a weird way to say this, but it is actually a D. Mm, okay. I'm going to mark you wrong. I don't think it matters, but you, know, you don't want to become a margin clerk to pass the 66, God knows. Uh, currently, a company issues 5% uh, AAA debentures at par. Two years ago, the corporation issued 4% AAA rate of debentures at par. Which of the following statements regarding the 4% is true? Uh, kind of an interesting one. Okay, so issued 5%. Uh, currently, they issue five percent. So, um, clearly, the interest rates have increased since. I love it. Well, the last so, yeah. So, it issued five percent at part two years. It was four. So you're on the right track. So you are correct to say interest rates have gone up. So interest rates went up. That would mean the price would go down. That's so right. So I'm going to go two. Two would be the right answer there. Excellent. Yeah, two is right. And if we're staying true that it's a, at a discount, uh, the current yield on the issue will be higher than the Q. Perfect, perfect, perfect. That was that was beautiful. Um, it's also beautiful as your tutor because there was one earlier. I forget what it was, and you were a little wobbly on the on the, which direction it was. And here you just nailed it. That was just your rationale was perfect. You were spot on in how you went about it. Excellent. Now, unfortunately, every question is only worth one. Point. You know, and if I were in charge and you nailed it like that, I'd give you, I'd say, you know, you get three points for that one. You know, that's a <laughs> judgment question. A uh, woman owns 9% of the common stock and her spouse owns 2% and wishes to sell his shares. Which of these falling is true? Um, well, they're considered affiliates because they that's, own more than 10%. You always assume the husband's wives are acting in concert. I mean, what's the point of getting married if you're not going to act in concert? Exactly. And if you own... If you're control your affiliates, you would That's have right. to uh, form 144. So you're in a control amount. There you go. One and three. Exactly right. right. He's, <laughs> I saw a lady who was being interviewed about uh, your, where she's at in life right now. And I thought she was going to reminisce about where she used to be because it used to be at a place. And she says that both her and her husband are very much more happier people now because they're not subject to all the regulatory rules they used to be. <laughs> mm. They've got out of the public market and into the private markets where they don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Uh, which of the following would be uh, considered a prohibited practice if performed by an investment advisor rep without disclosure? So this is you. So what are you going to be in trouble for if Sam does which of these things without uh, appropriate disclosure? 
Um, so prohibited. So I, I think you're allowed to own mutual funds. It's not in your recommended list. But yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think you're getting in trouble for owning a mutual fund. And I think that inheriting stock yeah, I don't think you fine. need to tell me about that. That's none of my business as your customer. Yeah, acting as an agent of the brokerage firm that exercises the trades you recommend. Um, I think C is fine because... Well, be careful. It says without disclosure. Where, so that means I don't know that you're making commissions as an agent I'll, of the broker dealer. I'll reread that. Right. So, so if I go look at your if I look at your notes, Sam, I'm going to do that right now as we speak. And uh, let's see if you disclose that to me. And it says that your broker dealer is Guggenheim. Oh, I can't remember. I can't believe I can never remember that. That's first class, my friend. Anyways, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes that's transparent. Sometimes it's not. So I was tutoring somebody earlier. It was Greenbridge, like capital management or something. It's not really transparent to me whether she's a broker or not, and she's making commissions. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine how mad I'm going to be if I find out besides my investment advisory fees to her, she was also making another 200000 in commissions. That wouldn't be okay, a problem as long as you said, hey, Dean, I have some, I'm an agent of a broker dealer, and I'm also going to make, you know, uh, commission, you know, payout. So the C is the answer, right? Because you have to disclose that to me. It's okay that you're an agent of the broker dealer. It doesn't need to be disclosed. You know, most firms, it's obvious that Morgan Stanley and Morgan Stanley Asset Management are the same firms. But in some situations, that's not transparent. It's like, you know, okay. I'm a global and you go, who the hell is Gama Global? And you don't know that there's some other relationship there, right? So it's C. Uh, that's very much a test question. Let's see what you were going to say. I think you're going to answer D. Uh, offering your client think... tickets to a game of professional football in which his son is the star quarterback and a principal stockholder. Well, that doesn't... I was thinking uh, principal. Yeah, that doesn't... Uh, yeah, with it, that's not your, your point. This isn't about approval. It's about disclosure. So it's actually C. Uh, that D situation would depend on your firm's internal policies. Okay. A stock analyst viewing a corporation's income statement would not be able to determine the company's um well you obviously get income revenues and expenses so it'd be cash on hand because it's an asset perfect to be in perfect. The sounds like you have a pretty good handle on that balance sheet stuff excellent yeah that's not really a give me for, for most people so right that's the you nailed it that's the income statement the top line revenue bottom line and expenses and our bottom line excellent uh one of your clients currently holds a long position in def common stock which of the following types of orders would offer client protection against a loss? Um, so the long position, you want to protect the downside, which would be um, bliss, so buy limit and sell stop, but you'd want to sell it to protect it. Or uh, to, um, not what well, you would want to buy to protect, but um, I think it'd be a, so I think it'd be sell stop. Excellent. Because... Excellent. Your rationale was perfect again. Just make sure I was a little worried there because you were going, you know, your, your rationale was perfect. Then you started, you know, got circling a little bit. I'm like, oh man, I hope he's going to stick to landing here. And uh, you did. Yeah, I lost so myself. You did. So just, you know, like I say, uh, make sure when you start doing your slobs over bliss and boom, boom, boom. Yep. Uh, an investor originally purchased a debt security at par. Unfortunately, the value has fallen to $920. Even though the company has reported record earnings, the decline in value would be representative of what type of risk? Well, considering it's a debt security, you have interest rate risk. Um, right on. So I would assume in this situation that the interest rates went up, causing the bond price to fall. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. You're pretty solid on the investment component part of it. Under terms of the Uniform Securities Act, uh, which of the following is an investment advisor for purposes of state regulatory jurisdiction? Is an investment advisor the state jurisdiction? Um, I know it's not 
D because that's incidental part of the business. Right on. It's not D. I like a process of elimination. You are correct. And so can you eliminate another one? You should be able to eliminate another one pretty quickly. Uh, I, I, I do eliminate A because yeah, you're talking about I, states. I, I, if I may, I say, I don't have to do anything for you. So now you got it to go 50, 50, B or C. Well, I don't, I think it's C, but I, I'm only That's saying that. Because you're absolutely think... right to C because it says it's an investment advisory subsidiary. So this is, I'm thinking bank. about that. It set up a, well, an investment advisory to charge fees, to manage money. It's not a bank that it's incidental. So this is, you know, Bank of America and Bank of America asset management, right? So, so you're correct. It's C. Uh, B is not correct. Right? Because it says it, they're not giving investment advice. B says specifically, you are not giving investment advice. It says a commercial bank with a place of business advise clients on banking matters. That's just a banker. That's just a banker. So yeah, good job. You were correct on that one. So trust trust your judgment. A, a couple trust questions, a couple trust questions. A grantor retained annuity trust is a planning tool to pass assets to beneficiary, usually children, in a way to minimize well i considering it's a trust and that would eventually go to your state boom yeah exactly that's i i kind of think of that's kind of a layup because i think i always say you know on 66 it's all about dead people and yeah. so here yeah. it says the past the benefits i'm talking about dead people income taxes aren't about dead people access to ICs are about dead people probably no yeah you nailed it on the Uniform Securities Act, all the following persons with no place of business in the state are exempt from registration as investment advisor accepts. So we're looking for somebody who needs to be registered. All our investment who needs to be registered. Okay. So isn't the, the day minimus is you tell me five. there you go it's five so it's no more than six which means it's six or well sorry five or less means yeah. no more than, right no more than yeah. six right who conduct a business no with no more than six de minimis you correct is five right so if you could so not with, with if, how would i be looking for that i, I guess that wording is well, kind of confusing. Well, I would have said so. I would have reversed the question with that. Without what I like to do is read once, and then say, "Okay, what am I looking for?" And so I, I would read it yeah. like I did under the Uniform Securities Act. All the fine persons with no place of business are exempt from registration as an investment advisor, except. So now I flip it and say, "Okay, I'm looking for somebody who needs to be registered in the state." So if I'm in state A and I have a de minimis is five. Right. So fewer than six, however you want to do that, fewer than six. And so now I say, okay, let me read one advisor who has no more than six. I have six clients in state B. I got to register. Yeah. Right. That's how it is. done. By the way, even if I tabled that and maybe I put a question mark next to it, advisors who deal exclusively with savings bank, no office, no problem. Advisor, federally covered investment advisors, no office, no problem. I deal with mutual funds, no office, no problem. Uh, B, C, and D, again, the other one I always use big time, Sam, is retail investors. Is it retail? Is it a Joe six pack? Right? Okay. I doubt that, you know, Sam, I doubt you guys have any retail Joe six pack clients at Google. I mean, most of those people are going to be institutional type investors, right? So, you know, my guess is that you guys have over 100 million in assets under management are going to be federally covered investment advisors, right? Uh, which of the long statements regarding unsolicited non-issuer transactions is true? So your point again, yeah, here I say, hmm, unsolicited means wasn't my idea. Non-issuer means secondary transaction. I believe you can only accept them with exempt securities. Um, well, here it's about unsolicited. So, you know, you're marking the ticket unsolicited, right? 
And so yeah. the state administrator comes in and says, Sam, I find it hard to believe that all these customers want to buy the same stock on an unsolicited basis. I mean, I mean, how do they even know each other? And I see you bought some. I say, you know, moving forward, I would like you to document that indeed those customers gave you those trades on an unsolicited basis. So okay. certainly so the administrator can say, I don't think your, your point, it's not a problem until it's a problem. And when it becomes a problem is when the state administrator steps in and says, yeah, really, you know, what I have in mind here is like a penny stock firm, like, you know, Jordan Belfort at uh, Wolf of Wall Street. And he's telling the state administrator that all these people called him to buy these penny stocks. Uh, I don't believe yeah. that. So that's B. Uh, when an individual is registered with a broker dealer as a change of residence, this is very much a test question. For any ad amendment to a U4, anything that was a no that becomes a yes or any updated information, those amendments need to be made. Oh, I hate this one because I know I get it wrong every time. I can never get it down, but I think it's 60. It's 30, so you're consistent. It's 30. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is uh, anything that becomes a no. Is yes, maybe, uh, maybe what you want to do. I see you, you doing. I'm a big fan of what I call a poor man's flashcard. And here's how I turn this into a poor man's flashcard. What I do is I take my Al Marco, and I get rid of the wrong answers. Mm -hmm. And that's you know. By the way, I'm not going to give grief because you're doing very well. So I'm not worried about you at all. However, that being said, I told you I was going to give you three points for some of those tough ones you've been getting. And God knows we don't want to give up a main shoe point and click recognition question. That's you know, that's kind of like a layup. We don't want to be giving up those. Yeah. So bad one. Yeah. Uh, as used in regulations, the term in personal investment advice means. Is a tricky one. Um, I'm with you. I'm with you. Personal and personal would be you're not actually handing out the advice. That's right. Um, so I'm C is not it because there's you're a you're absolutely right. C is not it. Team of advisors. There still there's people there. Um, I think it's. I think it's B. Good job. Uh, now I'm glad you got it right, but the another trick team tells people is too long to be wrong. You know, and the, the reason that drives, again, Chuck Nuts, the guy at Kaplan who does this and Brian, is because usually what they do is they start out with their answer and they reverse engineer the distractors, which are the technical names for wrong answers. And uh, sometimes that uh, that works. Again, we only use tricks when all else fails. The process of determining how a portfolio's funds will be apportioned among different categories of investments is known as... Asset allocation. Right on. And is asset allocation... Uh, passive or active management? It would be active. Gotcha. It's passive. So be careful. When we rebalance the portfolio, it's going to be passive. We are going to rebalance the portfolio like every you know six or 12 months, but that's still considered active. Uh, oh, man, look at this one. Now, on a question like this, I sometimes like to read the last sentence first because, boy, look at all that stuff. So if the transaction is completed, so I'm reading that first. So, okay, I know I'm going to be reading about a transaction. And you fail to disclose that the bonds were sold in a proprietary transaction. So that sounds like I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be in trouble here, it sounds like. Uh, and, so, and you receive client consent. You would have. Okay, so now let's see what they're asking us. Your high net worth advisory client has a large cash position in his money market account. Is considering using the gas to purchase an investment property. You believe that the real estate will not provide the same returns that he can realize by investing in bonds. So you prepare a proposal that estimates the income stream and the potential capital growth of the portfolio of convertible bonds currently in the firm's inventory. The recommendation is quite suitable for the client based on the current objectives. And so now they're asking you uh, what is about this situation going to be true. You would have. So you didn't receive client consent is what they're saying. Yeah, that's right. 
That would, that would be a commit. Uh, you, transaction, you failed to disclose that you were the customer bought these from and you failed to disclose and you failed to receive client consent. Or we could read it either yeah. way and you receive, yeah, that's right. By the way, you should almost always have the, 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 the sometimes we call the compliance department the sales prevention department. And almost always it's going to be something you did something wrong. So, you know, you can eliminate from the answer set that, you know, the broker did a good, fine job, you know. A frequent concern of parents initiating a savings plan for the college education of their child is a lack of control over those assets, particularly if the child decides to forego a higher education. Uh, when you have a client who shares this concern, it would be most appropriate to... Lack of control over the assets. Um, I'm between Atma and 529. So you want to be able to transfer it. Yeah, so, you know, like that's not how I act, but your logic is good. I think I think you're going to end up with the right answer. Uh, 529 is only for education expenses. Boom. So I would go, uh, is it 529? I thought yeah. it was Atma. Oh, no, yeah. no. You, I, I thought you were going to get it right, Sam. Here's why I thought you were yeah. going to get right, because it says your client is concerned the kid's not going to college. Hey, if you get that kid in Atma, once he's 25, that's his money. Mm. With a 529, remember, you could give it to the next kid, right? So if you have okay. more than one kid, you get, you know you have a diversified portfolio of kids, right? And so with a 529, uh, you know, uh, they have a question on the test about like a, a sister and then, you know, what happens, you can give it to the brother. But uh, I would tell you that in every question, uh, it's, you know, the 529 is definitely there, right? So the reason that the custodial account is going to be a good is because they're, they're, you you lose control of the assets. You can't revoke the gift in an uh, account, right? And it okay. says here, lack of control of the assets. So when you're the custodian, you control the assets, but not when that kid reaches uh, 18 or 21 in the UGMA version, uh, up to 25 in the UGMA version. Okay. By the way, that outma is very testable as well. Kids tax ID number, one minor, one custodian, no margin. An investment advisor rep is assuring clients of steady returns. That already sounds like a problem. Uh, under NASA's model rule of unethical business practices of investment advisors, investment advisor reps, and fairly covered advisors, this activity is. That would be prohibited because you're guaranteeing a profit. Yeah, steady returns means, you know, uh, you're saying that, hey, it's no lose. Uh, ooh, I like this. So here's kind of what we were talking about earlier. This does reflect uh, what I tell people. I don't think you're going to have, because you got a simple function calculator. You couldn't even do this if I told you to do it, uh, discounted cash flow. But I do think you should know inputs and outputs. Right. So if I'm getting a bunch of future payments, the the obvious one that people use compared to the bond would be the lottery. And I say, Sam, you won the lottery. You want a million dollars like right now, or do you want a hundred thousand dollars a year for 15 years? And what we would do on the hundred thousand dollars is discounted cash flow to see what is the present value of a hundred thousand dollars paid 15 years. Now, obviously, the hundred thousand this year, Sam is worth more than the $100,000 in the 15th year. So what is not necessary to do discounted cash flow as a valuation technique on a bond or a stock with right. a dividend? The rating wouldn't matter. Right on, right on. very decimal. If we apply that to stocks, it would be called the dividend discount bond. Okay. And that would be a test question. You can't do discounted cash flow on a stock that doesn't have a dividend. And if we do it on a stock where we expect the dividend to grow, that would be called the dividend growth model. And then the test question is, can you apply discounted cash flow to a stock? And the answer is yes, if it has a dividend. That's testable. No dividend. You can't do this on a growth stock. Test question number two. Can you apply a dividend growth model on a preferred stock? The answer is no, because the dividend doesn't grow. Okay. And it's a fixed dividend. 
Uh, test question number three. If I can do both dividend discount model or dividend growth model. So, you know, I'm Mr. Buffett and I'm thinking about buying Bank of America and Bank of America has a 21 cent quarterly dividend. And I make the ex expectation that that dividend may be raised. In other words, it was 18 cents. Now it's 21 cents. And I make the assumption at some future date, maybe it'll be 24 cents. Uh, test question number three, what would result in a higher valuation uh, for Bank of America using the dividend discount model, where I assume the dividend static does not change, or the dividend growth model, what would result in a higher valuation? I have to say the growth model. Right on, right on. Which of banks do you consider the most risky in a bull market? Um, good call. Uh, I think it's I don't want to jump to it quick. I think it's writing naked calls. That's pretty Yeah, you should sketchy. always stress yourself. I, I don't think, listen, as your tutor, so far, jumping quickly has not had any uh, negative result for you. So just trust that, you know. It, it, uh, and as I said, I like it. I like that you're... Now, give me, don't get me wrong. You might want to read the full answer set. Uh, but, you know, usually that your, your flash, just as a test taker in general, usually flash responses are the best response. So, you know, you don't want to outsmart yourself. And so... You know, I have some, you know, it, it's it's better that you have brain power capable of doing it, but, you know, that's a separate issue. <laughs> some people aren't capable of outsmarting themselves because they're not smart enough to do that. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, I had a guy and, oh my God, he gave me this beautiful wrong answer. I said, where did any of that come from? I mean, it's not in the question. So, you know, just make sure when you, you're reading that full answer set, you don't talk to yourself out of your, your original answer. You know, I hope you remember saying, if what if they meant they don't? So don't be bringing extra stuff into questions. Uh, which of my firms would be a federally covered investment advisor? Federally covered has more than 110 yep. million. So uh, it looks to me. Like yeah, I mean, that's an that. aim and shoot point click. That's an aim and shoot point click. And boom. Um, that's how they ask it too. So, you know, I get people who are memorizing those numbers. So you, and I'm glad you knew the hundred million, but then they get a little, you know, blown away when it's not, you know, asking you with a hundred. It's just giving you examples, and then you got to pick them out of the the lineup. Mm -hmm. uh, which of the is least appropriate for a client primarily concerned with liquidity? Uh, to be a DPP. Yeah, boy, I was just reading about uh, a Rod or a Rod, man. You know, you have uh, a limited partner in the Timberwolves. Glenn Taylor is the general partner. And apparently he had troubles coming up with his payments. And well, I'll tell you what, general partner Glenn Taylor, kind of a jerk, said, uh, listen, hey, Rod, you missed your next staged investment. So welcome to the partnership, but you're remaining limited. I'm keeping control of the team. And oh, now the problem is that money is not, I don't know how rich a Rod is. I mean, I don't know. But, you know, uh, I would think he has problems because he couldn't come with money. Now, He's going to have problems getting out of that because he needs permission from Glenn Taylor to even sell that to somebody else. And you know, I think, and the guy was, I think, kind of being a jerk. Maybe not. I don't know the guy. But he said, he's, but he's welcome to be my limited partner. Like, you know, okay, thank you so much for giving me $400 million that I'm going to keep. You know, so. Insane. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, and, you know, that I can, apparently, who knows what really happened backstage. They said, Carl, I was thinking about helping him out. And, you know, I think uh, Guggenheim is, I think, in some sports uh, teams as well. Bobby. Is it? There you go. Bobby. Howard is an investment advisor rep with Hughes and Company. By the way, if, in hindsight, a Rod probably should have lined up his financing, you know, probably before, <laughs> before he jumped in, right? <laughs> Uh, Howard is an investment advisor right, with Hughes & Company, a state registered investment advisor, principal office state O, office of state B and D. Howard works out of an office in state P and has four retail clients uh, there. Uh, Howard has 25 retail clients in state D, six in state M, one in state O. Uh, Howard would have to be registered as an investment advisor rep in. So he's state covered. So we'd be going through this looking for a place of business and we'd be looking for perhaps, does he have de minimis? And so, looks to me. Uh, yeah, it looks like, uh, let's just go through it. So state O is where the investment advisor has an office. I don't see he has mm -hmm. an office. Uh, and yeah. they, 
investment advisor, uh, uh, having its principal office of state P and D, Howard works in state P, so he's definitely got to be registered there. He has 25 clients in state D, so he still has, has to be registered there. He has six clients. There's another de minimis, doesn't meet it. State M, uh, one client in state O, he doesn't meet de minimis. So what say you? I say states P, D, e and M. What do you say? D and M? Yeah, I think that's correct, right? Because the O is the investment advisory firm. The AMT is designed to ensure certain high income in taxpayers pay tax. This is done by back, adding back the ordinary income on items such as accelerated depreciation, excess intangible drilling costs. The term to describe these items on the taxpayer's AMT is? That's tax preference items. Right on. I wouldn't worry about the, the accelerated depreciation, but I would worry about private activity muni bonds as being a preference item. A uh, client of yours is investing, investigating a particular mutual fund. She mentioned she saw a blurb on the internet that the fund has had net redemptions over the past six months and asked you how to explain how that might affect the, uh, affect the uh, fund's perf uh, performance. Redemptions, that might affect the fund. Um, okay. I would think that performance would suffer because you have to pay out those redemptions. I like it. It's forced liquidation, right? A good time to buy because the supply of shares exceeds the demand. Possibly. I'm not going to say yes or no. Uh, is it two and three? How many of the fund expenses are fixed? With less assets in the fund, the expense ratio will increase. Hmm. Say two and three. We got gotcha. you. Yeah. Two and four. You were on the right track. If the assets go down, but we have the same level of expenses, that means our expense ratio goes up, right? Because mm -hmm. we have level expenses and now we don't have as much of assets to you know have that over. So it's two and four. Not a bad miss. Would you say two and three? So three. Let's see what you said. Three. This would be a good time to buy because the supply of the shares. Well, that doesn't. It's. It's not the shares of the mutual fund that go up and down. It's the shares in the portfolio, right? right. So whether we have more people investing in the fund doesn't affect that, right? Yeah. If we go from a billion to two billion, just because people sent us money, that, that has no effect on the NAV's performance. It's the portfolio of securities. Uh, since its inception in 1986, virtually all the states have replaced UGMA with UGMA. UGMA. It's generally agreed that one of the primary benefits of UGMA over UGMA is. Well, I don't know if this would be a benefit, but what you said earlier about the 25, being 25 with the UGMA, you do surrender the control with the majority, right? Yeah, that's right. You have both of them you can control. That's I don't really care for this question myself, but greater flexibility in naming custodians, no, it's the same. Greater flexibility in naming beneficiaries, no, the minor is the minor is the minor. Mandatory surrender rate control of a majority, yeah, the control is going to be 18, 21, or 25, depending on the state. Uh, this okay. is the reason I wouldn't worry about it at all, but it's the greater flexibility of the type of product, property you can transfer. I wouldn't worry about that at all on the test. Investment risk may broadly be characterized as either systematic risk or unsystematic risk. Both types of risk constitute total or absolute risk. Total risk is measured by? Total risk. Now I'm, always, I'm between standard deviation and beta. Beta's the market. Yeah, the I love that. So let's see, now you're on the right track. You said beta is the market, and this specifically tells you the market as well as the security. So total risk. Total risk is 
Well, standard deviation is the variability of the returns. That's right. Um, oh man, I shouldn't be blanking on this one. But you, you're, yeah, I, I don't think you are. I mean, this is a, as your tutor, another one of these situations. You're not completely blanking because when you're talking out loud, almost always you're on the right track. It's just can you connect the oh. dots, so to speak? Both types of risk together constitute twin labs. So you were right to say that standard deviation is about variance. So is that variance? So now what you got to decide is does standard deviation take into account the variance of both the securities volatility as well as the market volatility? Because if so, A is the answer. Now you should have said, and you were on the right track to tell me beta is out because beta is only yeah. about systematic risk. So that tosses beta out. Okay. And then that, by the way, that B and D are just not anywhere in the neighborhood. So yeah. indeed it is standard deviation because standard deviation relates not only to the security, but also the market as a whole. You know, I always say I'm using my basketball uh, fan analogy about, I got two basketball players. One gives me, both of them have an average of 20 and 10. But one guy gives me 40 and 20 and gives me zero. The other guy gives me 22 this night, 18 the next night, 20. Yeah, and so the guy who gives me 22, 18, 20 has less standard deviation, less volatility, neither good nor bad, because I might need the guy to give me you know, 40 and 20. Now, here's the point. Now, I can also compare that standard deviation to the entire universe of NBA players and say, hey, Sam, what can I tell you? I know what you want me to pay you in your contract, but you know, let me just show you what the average is of free bar. You know, I just, I just don't think you're that guy. You know, by the way, you know, <laughs> I was thinking, you know, Julian Randall had a great season and uh, the Knicks paid him a lot of money. And I thought, okay, well, Saturday, is this going to be a regression to the mean? I mean, is this going to be the the one year that he actually was able, yeah, that guy, or is he going to be that guy every year? You know, I don't know if you're an NBA fan, but last night, oh my God, LeBron, he's nearly 40 years old. I could not believe it. I mean, he, he he's taken down I mean, all these young men. I'm like, wow. It's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. It's incredible. Hitting threes, dunking on people. I'm like, and then it was funny. I don't know if exhaustive afterwards. I thought, oh, LeBron, say it ain't so. They asked him, how much longer do you got? He said, not long. Oh, not really? <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah. I was like, he goes, yeah. He says, let's be clear. I'm not doing another 21 years. So this, I'm on the back sure. side. And I thought, man, Jeannie Buss. And my, hey, LeBron, well, you know, after a game like that, I was expecting the opposite. I'm going to be doing this for another 10 years. Uh, yeah, anyways, right. LeBron has a, 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 a less standard deviation because that is, you know, his, his performance is pretty standard. And then we could compare that to the, to the rest of the league, so to speak. The league would be systematic. Which of the following statements is true regarding jurisdiction of the SEC and the Securities Act of 34? I just, when I get an SEC question, I just go, they're God. And state administrators think they are, and that's how I play out the question, right? I, there's these 50 demigods running around. I know they, they have jurisdiction over exchanges and SROs. Absolutely. Got that. Yeah, absolutely, they do. Um, jurisdiction for broker dealers and investment advisors. Uh, two, also they yeah, do. Absolutely. Because are under federal. Jurisdiction over banks and savings and loans during their securities activities. Hmm. I don't think they have it over banks and savings and loans. Yeah, they like to run the world, but they don't, right? Banks are Federal Reserve Board, Comptroller Currency, FDIC. I always joke, Xander, they say FINRA's on line one. The SEC is on lane two. I'm picking up lane two. You know, the yeah. SEC says, Dean, do you know who we are? I said, yeah. You have primary jurisdiction, interpretation, and enforcement of the domestic securities laws of the United States of America. And can throw me in jail. They say, Dean, we'll get along fine just as long as you remember that. I think that should be on their business cards. I'm with the government and I'm here to help. Now I'm joking, but you know. Uh, which of one would be most suitable for, yeah, but kind of, I always like it when the government kind of loses, just I don't know why. But so, you know, right now we have a guy, Gary Gensler, who's a former partner of Goldman Sachs, who was the head of the SEC. And he's been, you know, going after crypto guys and in court and he's been losing. <laughs> I'm like, <"Ew." laughs> 
<laughs> so, they, they, they didn't they didn't have their own free will in the court want to go along with ETFs for cryptocurrency, but they lost so many court cases. They finally said, okay, guys, we guess we got to give up. Yeah. And by the way, anytime the SEC files some kind of a lawsuit, the state administrators file friends of their court brief, right? They're kind of hand in hand. Which the following would be most suitable for a young couple investing in their IRAs? Growth mutual funds. Yeah, come on. That's a layup. That's a layup. Under the Uniform Securities Act, which of the following investment advisors is required to include a balance sheet? Um, I know the 35000 is a custody thing. And if you're below that, you would have to. Yeah. Right. Um, that includes number two also. Right on. Uh, you're right. Two and three. Uh, an advisor maintains less than 35000 and that worth that would depend on what you're doing if you have custody, right? So it says it doesn't tell me whether you have custody or not. Number three, it's mm -hmm. two and four. If okay. I collect as an investment advisor prepaid expenses six months more in advance, then I give you a balance sheet because that's a contingent liability. You know, it's like when you sign up for tutoring, right? You're prepaying for something I haven't done yet. And so that you run the risk that you hit the button and it doesn't show up. So if I'm going to exactly. charge you six or more months in advance uh, for services I have not rendered, I'm going to have to give you a balance sheet so you can see whether I'm capable of delivering what I promise. Right. So uh, two and four. Uh, yeah, what you said about three was correct, but they just didn't say have anything in there about custody, right? Right. So if there's nothing about custody, and I think we kind of talked about that. Uh, NASA's statement of policy of unethical business practices for broker dealers and agents contains a extensive list of prohibited practices. However, it would not be considered a violation. So one of these things is a good thing, and the rest are bad things. Um, one's a violation. Right on. Uh, inventory is a principal capacity. So that's a violation. That's right. Individuals employed, same here. Uh, C, C is a violation. You have to. Oh, no, play. no, no. no. Uh, I know I had this earlier. I had a question about this, and it was you're allowed to do that. Yeah, we can share commissions as long as we're both prices sure. at the same firm, right? Yeah. So you and I work on a deal together, and we decide we're going to split that. That's fine. Uh, okay. Test question Do we have to tell the client what our split is? Split is. No, if you don't okay, have to tell Sam them. Sam and Dean, we work as a team. You're getting two for one, Sam and Dean. We're going to manage money for you. And they say, well, how are you guys splitting up uh, the money? I say, none of your damn business. I probably wouldn't say it that way. But I don't have to disclose how we split commissions amongst the team, right? Or the fees. Uh, borrow money, boom, that's bad. So A, B, and D are bad. C is fine as long as we're under, oh, look, here comes a big word, common control. That means we're at the same broker dealer. An employer wishing to obtain long-term capital agreement would prefer the employer to offer I like this one. This is a kind of a, a good, I think, version of this. I think people get in the weeds on this unnecessarily. Long-term capital gain treatment. Um, hmm. I'm going to urge to say non-qualified. Yeah, I, I you can I like your tap plans almost even when you're missing questions you haven't missed much so I wouldn't be too worried about it, but I like the way you're attacking you're trying to find a way to kind of lever your way into a question get kind of a started in I like it as aggressive, I like what you're thinking so non qualified you should know means there is no tax advantage. Non qualified, so that means non qualified you're... stands for different types of like you know there's a non qualified IRA or yeah well non qualified rather. means you're going to get taxed at your point you're. If I give you non followed stock options as your employer, that's going to be taxed at ordinary income when you exercise. It's going to be part yeah. of your compensation. Whereas I give you incentive stock options, it's going to be taxed at long-term capital gains when you exercise. Right. Yeah. So Elon uh, had those uh, Tesla options. He sold, what, $9 billion of Tesla stock to pay the taxes. But good news for him, all of those options he had in Tesla were incentive stock options. Mm -hmm. So that means that, uh, what, $5 billion is going to be taxed at long-term capital gains rate rather than 
ordinary income tax rates. By the way, I wouldn't be surprised if he has both non-qualified options at Tesla and incentive stock options, right? So, and that, by the way, is the test question, is that that is, has a preferable tax treatment, whereas the non-qualified, when you exercise, it's going to be part of your compensation and taxed as, as income. Under Uniform Securities Act, when may an investment advisor legally have custody of money and securities belonging to a customer? Uh, if they haven't prohibited it, sure. The advisor has notified the administrator does custody, sure. Um, I think that if, if you have discretionary authority, you can also have custody, right? So it's got to be one yeah, of two. Yeah, so, yeah. So that means, remember, it says does not, and you're correct. It does. So that means it's one and two. Good job. Under NASA's model rule on unethical business practices, investment advisors, investment advisor reps, federally covered advisors, which of the following practices is appropriate for an advisor who does not have custody? So what's appropriate for somebody who does not have custody? Well, I know for, for A, I know that you... Um... If you if you can't contact them, you can't sell it. If you don't have uh, discretion, so it's fine. That, that's fine. Um, and okay, I was just thought about discussing it. Um, that you can't do that without discretion. That's B, right. You can't do that. That authority, trade security, losing him. Uh, if she didn't without authority, yeah, that's that's inappropriate. You cannot do that. Security the client or it's a good client. Uh, the and D the so I'm going with A. Perfect, excellent, you nailed it. Uh, according to the Investment Advisor Act, which of the following is always a natural person, a living, breathing human being walking planet Earth? I'd be an IAR. That's you, right? Uh, administrator has the authority to do which of these following? Which of these following? Which of these? Uh, you can issue a cease and desist without a hearing. That's right. And so uh, knocks that out. So one, uh, you the administrator can't sentence you to prison. So it's one and three. One and three. Issue the cease. You are correct. One and three. Boom. Now to take you to prison, you gotta uh, you gotta go to the court. Uh, which of the following securities is least suitable for a qualified money purchase plan? Qualified money purchase plan. Now, when, like I asked you earlier, the non is this qualified versus non qualified? Yeah, this is a retirement plan. So even if it was not a lot of any retirement plan, one of these things would never be suitable for a retirement plan. Um, any retirement plan. bond. Yeah, right. Because that would be stupid because you're getting tax free income, right? Uh, Lisa is considering investing in gold. She owns a portfolio of stocks, bonds, and money markets relative to her existing portfolio. The primary gold investment is most likely. Uh, I think that's low correlation. It doesn't move like the stock market does. Yeah, we're, that's what we're hoping, right? We're hoping that we're going to get some different correlation to our financial assets. And it's also a uh, very good uh, inflation edge as well. An agent registered with a broker dealer in this state would be permitted to do all the following except. Which you can you can can't you never wow I, I want to say the share and the profits I feel like you can never do that but with written permission yeah you know. no that's one's kind of weird you can with proportionate capital and principal approval okay so that's not okay. Our money. Um, split commissions. Um, splitting commissions with another agent, a different uh, affiliated. If it was unaffiliated, that's yeah, a you, remember, that's bad. You, got, you got that one earlier. And you said, yeah, you should know B. Yeah. 
Do I have to, yeah, we're splitting commissions? No. There you go. Um, burn money. I know, I think it's, I want to say it's borrowing money. It is because your family member is a client. If it wasn't a client, it wouldn't be a problem. But they're a client. client. They're a client of the firm. You can't borrow money from clients of the firm. Uh, among investor objectives of privatization of capital. So growth, income, safety, and principle are our, our main ones. Which of the long would be most appropriate for inclusion in the portfolio of this kind of investor? It's not blue chip stock. It's not international funds. Um, that, I like that. That's exactly how I would have attacked it with process of elimination. I love how you're attacking it. So you got a 50-50. Uh, by the way, you're always going to miss, or at least I always miss these kind of questions because I'm pretty aggressive and, you know, sometimes I squeeze the trigger on you got to think again, very conservative. I think that I remember preservation of capital being always associated with money market funds. Yeah, right. Because the treasury bonds still have interest rate risk. You're correct. Right. Treasury bonds, 20 year treasury bonds, interest rates go up. You can kill them. Goodbye, Silicon Valley Bank, right? Oh. right? You would think that'd be pretty conservative to be beyond buying long term treasury bonds. On the investment company of 1940, SEC permits mutual funds. To make sales charge discounts available to, oh, I kind of like this one. This one jumps out because I know investment clubs don't get discounts. That's right. breakpoint discounts. That's exactly right. To get a concession discount or allowance, right? You got to be you know affiliated with somebody, right? So, boom, yep. Yeah. Uh, which of the following would be considered unethical under the NASA model rule? of unethical business practices. We're getting a lot of these on the test. You get 25 of your 100 questions are disclosures and unethical business practices. So those are two big okay. honey holes in terms of uh, performance opportunities, target rich environments. Which of following would be considered unethical uh, for investment advisor, investment advisor, and federally covered advisors? So three of these um, things first are ethical, off, one of these things is not. Yeah. A, um, since... Going back to the other questions, to client, uh, that would be, I think, unethical. I'm not answering that yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a thought. Um, B. If you disclose it, that's fine. Investment advisor receives an order to buy from your advisor client. Uh, agent agent agency cross transaction is fine with disclosure. Right on. Investment advisor varies the annual fee based on each client's assets. Less for those entire balances. Hmm. D seems sketchy. Um, varies the annual fee. Charging less for oh no, that's I think that's fine because you'd be getting right. But that's a proportionate percentage, correct? Right, right. You're correct. So I'm going that. You're right. Again, it can be a bona fide loan from a lending institution, not the person who works at the bank. From the bank, yeah. right? It has to be an unnatural person. Uh, the Investment Advisor Act of 1940 requires registered investment advisors to have a chief compliance officer. The individual uh, is responsible for ensuring compliance with the Code of Ethics for all of these, except. Um, you'd have to do it with everyone that works for your firm that's so it would, it would be yeah. Yeah, a C affiliated with yeah this is you know your you know the firm you're clearing trade that that's their deal not yours uh when advisory clients wish to structure their portfolios to support companies uh that engage in social or environmental policies that they agree with it is known as well this thing was uh, a fat and now it's not what's that Impact investing? Yeah, impact investing, ESG. Uh, Susie Stans, well then Uncle Ray is a client of yours and asking for some investment ideas for Susie's college education uh, with the lowest possible tax impact. Ray tells you that he set up an UGMA for Susie's older brother, Sammy. But when Sammy turned 18, he took the money, bought a motorcycle and joined a commune. Uh, Ray wants to avoid seeing something like that happen again. What would you probably best suggest to Ray? 
I would not do an Atma because that would give. Yeah, you'd have the, the same money. problem over again, right on. Yeah. Um, I think it's a 529 because it's only education. Yeah, always, almost always, that's going to be the case, right? Because you keep control of the assets and then you can, you know, if he would have done that for, as I mentioned, if he would have done that for uh, Sammy, he could have taken it back and give it to Susie, right? So mm -hmm. you keep retain control. On the Uniform Securities Act, the administrator is required to provide which of the following in a disciplinary proceeding. This is very much a test question. You'd certainly want to give them an opportunity for a hearing. That's right. Uh, written findings. You'd also want to written facts of yeah. That's written you findings. Know, that way you can dispute it. You can't dispute it if they don't tell you what you're in trouble for. Uh, and a prior, pro, pro, uh, excuse me, appropriate prior notice. So one, one, one two, three. Right on. Be. Right on. Right on. Express as a percentage. What is the total return for a newly issued zero coupon debt? Uh, priced at 95. Kind of a weird question, but I, I, I think I know what they're kind of getting at. The total return. Um, well, it's going to, it'll eventually pay back. I mean, yeah, you're on the right track again. Exactly. Right. So I think the trick here is that uh, I don't have to worry about the plus or minus gain or loss right because we buy the zero coupon bond your point we're not getting anything other than that 50 bucks right yeah. so now we know that we got 50 and what did we spend to make the 50 um 950 is that what yeah you, so we take 50 and let's see if this is correct the good thing about math if we're not correct it won't show up as an answer right so i'm thinking okay so <laughs> all i made was the 50 i don't have any plus or minus there so i'm just going to take 50 Divide by 950, I get 5.26. Okay. Right? So yeah. I think that's kind of an odd way to ask about total return. But total return, remember, is what you get in income plus or minus your gain or loss. Ooh. Right? So here we don't have any income. So it's going to simply be the $50. Okay. Uh, one of the differences between broker dealers and investment advisors is the disclosures that must be made when an IA is acting as a principal or agent in a transaction with an advisory client. In the case of a firm registered in both capacities, those disclosures would not be required when? Mm. Um. Is it that it's an exempt security? Now, gotcha. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's a transaction with a client of both entities, the trade is not based on the advisory services rendered. So you're just acting in your broker capacity. This one was kind of tough. So here we're just acting in our, you know, our regular capacity as a stockbroker is what that's saying. Right. So that's kind of a weird phraseology, but that's where that comes from. Uh, the estate account is open with family asset protector as a registered investment advisor. Management decisions regarding the account must be made at the direction of. I kind of like this one. Um, management decisions. That would be the estate's executor. Right on. Uh, does the Uniform Securities Act have jurisdiction or authority over an executor or the administrator in this situation? If I am liquidating securities as an executor or administrator, am I subject to the Uniform Securities in a template? If you say yes, you're telling me it's a non-exempt transaction. If you say no, you're telling me that officers of the court, executors of estates, trustees and bankruptcies, sheriffs and affidavit forfeiture are not subject to the Uniform Securities Act. Those transactions are exempt. So are transactions by an executor or administrator of an estate exempt transactions under the Uniform Securities Act? No. Yes. 
They are exempt transactions under the Uniform Securities Act. So be careful, not a trustee in a trust account, a trustee in bankruptcy you know, or in this situation. So yes. Uh, investors concerned the purchase of bonds to diversify his portfolio. He should just decide to buy uh, strips instead of treasure bonds. His major risk would be, I kind of like this. You're going to get some questions on zero coupon bonds, of which strips certainly are. Mm. It's not. Okay, that's not credit risk. I know that. That's right. Not credit risk because it's U.S. Treasury right on. So it's not credit risk. Not interest rate risk because you're um, not really you're zero coupon. Yeah, yeah. So you're answering C. That is correct. Right? You don't have reinvestment risk because you're not getting paid every six months. Your rate of return is locked in. Right. His major risk would be purchasing power risk. I don't know. No. That could be it. I think it's going to be C, but you are going to have purchasing power. But I think they're asking a specific to instead of treasury bonds. And in both of those, we would have that. And kind of a weird question. Investors considering the purchase of some bonds to diversify portfolio. If he should decide to purchase a strip instead of a treasury bond, his major risk, well, I'm going to say interest rate because they're going to be more volatile. What say you want to do it's not reinvestment because you're yeah, not, you know you're the reinvestment risk you don't have because remember you're going to get every in a regular bond every six months you get paid here you don't so your rate of return is locked in you might have a bigger problem at the end but not along the okay. way so do you want something different i'm not sure I mean, we might miss this one we'll see i think it's c what do you think go with whatever you go with your answer okay if we miss it it's going to be d but uh, Jessica is an investment advisor representative for an SEC registered investment advisor. She lives in state X and receives a letter from a former college friend requesting contribution to a friend's political campaign for governor of state Y. As it happens, Jessica firms uh, provides advisory services to state Y's employee retirement fund. And Jessica actively solicits business from other state agencies. Which of the following actions would be permitted under the SEC pay to play rule as it concerns our firm. So this is about pay to play. Um, I remember it's either 350 or 150. That's it's correct. The um, and the 350 or 150 is dependent on what? So you're correct. It's either 150 or 350, depending on what for our friend Jessica. Is it if you've uh, is it like is it if you've already had someone donate? Oh, no, it's I, if Jessica can vote for this person. She can vote. So okay. What's less of a conflict of interest? I can vote for you or not. What's more of a conflict? More of a conflict would be I can't vote for you. If I can vote for you, that means you're representing me as my I'm one of your constituents. And I should be able to give you more money. So it's 350 if I can vote for you. If I can't cannot. vote for you, then it's 150. So now we got to see, okay, where does Jessica? So Jessica is in state X. So we're assuming she's a voter in state X. And then the campaign is for governor state Y. And so since she can't vote in state Y, it's not going to be 350. It's going to be 150. Yeah. So. Uh, I would expect that on your test. Okay. Uh, an investor is trying to decide whether to purchase 10000 of a U.S. Treasury bond or a highly rated corporate bond. The price of the Treasury bond is 102 uh, and 20, 30 seconds, while the price of the corporate bond is 99 and 3 eighths. And the investor decides to purchase treasuries disregarding commissions. The price difference is. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm doing the same. So boom, boom, yeah. boom.
we got thirty two five, but it's um it's ten thousand dollar face amount would make it yeah. three. Excellent, three excellent, excellent, excellent. That's what I would have done too. I would have, you know, do the math. Uh, the investment yeah. advisor rep, that's you, is required to make disclosure to the client. So Sam needs to disclose to the client. Um. You would have to disclose that you're going to receive a commission on the sale. Right on. Um, you recommended it was client. I just think it's just. Um, you would have to disclose three because if they have similar objectives, you'd want similar recommendations, I think. But, but also because maybe that client, eh, let me wait on that one. Okay. Uh, you'd want to disclose four because if, you, if you're Absolutely. not going to trade the same. Absolutely. Wanna... There'd be reasons for that, right? I say Sam, you're a young man and I'm an old man. So yeah, my investments are different. So two and four, but also let me wait for three. Um, yeah. Recommended minor inconsistent. I think that it's two, three, and four. Yeah, I, I think you're going to miss this because three... It's, you know, two and four, three transactions recommended to a specific client are inconsistent with those of another client with objects that are identical. The, the reason I think we're going to probably miss this one is because there might be more than one investment vehicle that accomplishes to get you there. So I could recommend different investment vehicles that are based on the same growth or income or safety of principle. So it'll be interesting. To see. I think we might miss that one. Uh, investor swaps identical issues of stock to establish a loss that is disallowed. That transaction is known as a wash sale. Yeah. How long do you have to wait to reestablish the position? Ooh, um, it's, uh, it's not 60 combined. Ah, you're still stuck on the 60. I hope you remember 30, 30, 30, 30. Oh, I was thinking the before you were and after. 30. Wash after. sales are 30. So it's your tutor. I'm teasing you. As your tutor. I want you every time you're going to put 60, put 30 instead. <laughs> uh, well, I was thinking about the 61 because um, I was thinking. Well, 60 with, days is a rollover for an IRA. It's a 60 day. 30 days before, 30 days after. 30 days after. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping you're going to hear my voice when you're down there taking your test. If you go to hit that wrong button, you're going to hear me going. Eh. <laughs> uh, John and Jane have a net worth of 20. Total assets of 150. Ugh. Their revolving credit on paid bills is A. Oh, my goodness. Uh, how much are their total liabilities? Okay, so uh, so I'm just looking up here, credit parts. I think it's, uh, how much is the total? It looks like eight, right? Yeah. They have a net worth of, oh, I get it. I, we got to do our balance sheet equation, right? So if I take 150 minus something, it equals 20. Yeah, minus 130. Yeah. And then you would... Well, that's it because the, the 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 bills are in there already, right? That eight thousand is already in there. So I take the I'm looking for the number that when I take one fifty minus something equals twenty, and that would be the one thirty. So the eight's in there already as part of the liabilities. That's a high end balance sheet question. I think you'd see it in the corporate setting more than you would see in a retail setting. If an investor wanted to verify a company's working capital, you would do so by reviewing. Uh, that's a Current assets, current liabilities, which are in the balance sheet. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, customer needs $10,000 to pay for a new house within the next year. This is on the test. The agent suggests they invest in a stock. Uh-oh. Performing extremely well in the past and, and assures the customer it can't go wrong. Oh, my God. According to the Uniform Securities Act, put to the following. You should have been in a money market fund. So, uh, I read all of them, and it looks yeah. like they're all... Yeah, I think yeah, I think this is a bad thing, right? That's pretty damn bad. I mean, you got all kinds of problems in that, that question. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Smith is a registered rep of a broker dealer. He believed the client's security was overvalued. If Smith exaggerated the amount by which the security was overpriced to protect the client from a downturn, each of the following statements is true except. 
They love making uh, up these questions where your heart's in the right place, but you still broke the rule, you know? Um, so, it's all, so it was dishonest and unethical, sure. Um, made an untrue statement. That's true. Um, I, mean, I don't know that you provide an investment advice for acting in a sales capacity, which is prohibited. It's not prohibited if you have disclosure of that. Um, but does he have disclosure of that? Um, engage in fraud in connection with the sale. I don't, I guess that's fraud. So, see? Yeah, good job, actually, because there wasn't a transaction. I'm trying to prevent the transaction, right? So, okay. see, good job. Which of my statements regarding the general partner of a direct participation program is not true? Not true. Um, I think A sticks out because you can borrow. That's correct. Um, is an active investor and assumes responsibility for all aspects of their operation. That's true. Active manager does not maintain a financial interest. You do maintain a financial interest. You have fiduciary relationship. I believe you do. Um, as yeah, it's your responsibility to help them make money. That's right. So what's so, not true? Okay. A the GP cannot borrow from the partnership, uh, compete with the partnership. That is a conflict of interest that can be handled through disclosure. But the GP does not maintain a financial interest and only receives income. That is not correct. So you missed it. That, that is definitely a conflict of interest, but can be uh, disclosed. Okay. Right. So, all right. I think you did a great job. Let's see what we did here. Oh, my God. That'll get it done, my friend. So yeah. I think we talked most of these along the way. Yeah. A couple of them. Yeah, we talked yeah, about yeah. that. Well, we just did that one. Uh, boom. Uh, interesting. Yeah, you were on the backside of that question. I don't. I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, you said you make a recommendation was an unsolicited basis. Yeah, this is about the agent. So, if I'm not registered in state, even if the transaction or the client's exempt, I'm not. I need to be registered in that state. So that's when people fall prey to quite a bit. Don't know if that makes you feel any better, but yeah. I get more worried when somebody's missing some question away I've never seen. Yeah, that was yeah. an obtuse kind of question. We're worried about that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you should always come up with 529. I mean, I'm just telling you in the beauty contest, the bake off, it's always the 521 they want you to come up with. I, as a joke, one time I did a suitability practice with somebody and we would tr we tried to do it with just the answer set and not reading the question. And I would say, okay, every time it says 529, that's what we're taking. <laughs> you know? yeah. And, you know, sometimes that works. Yeah. Like, I'll I read the answer set. You said uh, two and three. It was two and four. So the three, yeah, the, that isn't the, 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 the NAV plus the sales charge isn't affected by how many people are coming into the fund or out of the fund. So that was kind of a high-end one. I don't feel too bad about that. Nice rolls, though. That's good. Uh, you said two, three, and four, and three. We uh, can... I, I thought we were going to miss this. I, I wasn't sure if this was a miss or not. Um, an investment yeah. advisor must provide full disclosure to his clients be even a hint, a hint of conflict. This includes the case where a recommended product will generate commission. We knew all that. Recommendation not consistent, yes. Any source being required. Yeah, sometimes this rationale kind of sucks. I mean, they're not really telling us. Uh, my my yeah. rationale would have been that three, I can have clients with same objectives and I get different products to them. But in my way, I would ration, ration die or reason that. A uh, hundred, boom. Yeah, that was, you know, um, that is definitely a conflict of interest, but it can be handled through disclosure. You know, and here it's saying what is not true. Which is the only statement? Yeah, I should have read that one. I read yeah. the active manager. I would think, I would think, because you know, I would think that uh, you know, you're probably organized as some kind of a partnership in some of your investments that you're making. All right. Well, that yeah. was pretty damn good, my friend. I'm very impressed with that performance. 
Uh, if you would like to, if you'd like to do that again, uh, I we can do uh, STC or we can do, okay. you know, some other one. But uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think where you're at is uh, fine. So 